Good morning. Welcome to our worship at Mordlachkirk this morning. Just a few announcements. First is, um, I've said it two weeks now, so please spread the word that we are starting with our junior church on the 29th of August. Then on the, from the 18th of August, we've changed, or I've changed the, we had a weekly uh, Zoom meeting um, called Plugged In. Now, during, when we were still in stricter lockdown times, that served a certain purpose. And um, we, we think that it served its purpose for that time. And now we're moving towards still having an online presence, but I'm um, trying to integrate it with meeting in person as well. So what I aim in doing is having a weekly video reflection uploaded onto our Facebook page and then exploring the idea of having a monthly get together sometime um, for folks who want to um, just have a good wee blether. And um, I, we, I will let you know how that um, goes when we get to that point. But from the 18th of August, we will be uploading weekly video reflections on our Facebook page. Then please take note that our next board and session meeting, which is coming Tuesday the 10th of August at 7 p.m., will be here in the church. This will be, since I've been here as the minister, our first in-person board and session meeting. Please pray for me, but I'm sure it will go wonderful. <laughs> um, um, and just take note that it will be here in church and not on Zoom as we have been doing over the past a couple of months. Then we were very gracious, uh, Mortlachkirk was very graciously offered a stall at the farmer's market coming Saturday, free of charge. Um, and we're very thankful for the opportunity. Um, we've had to get a few things together at very short notice. And um, in consultation with Violet and a few other members, we thought it would be good if we could have fresh fruit and vegetables to sell on Saturday. Now, we appeal to you, you know, it's short notice, but anybody who can help us with fresh fruit and vegetables, please contact either myself at the Mans or Violet. Um, her number is 08, uh, 01340820082. Um, you can contact her or myself at the Mans, which is 821060. If you got, didn't get that numbers, ask me again afterwards. I will be at the church's exit. Um, so please, if you're able to help us with that, please let us know. Let us listen to our call to worship as we turn our attention to our worship this morning. We meet here with every doubter and every questioner we meet here with those who celebrate and those who mourn. We meet here with those who wait and those who long. We meet here with the hungry and the lonely. We meet here with the rich and the poor. We meet here with all your people, ready to worship just as we are. Amen. Hymn 459, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Thank you.
So this morning, I am going to tell you a few interesting facts about one of my favorite subjects, bread. Did you know that a rolled up piece of white bread was used to erase graphite before rubber erasers were invented? Did anyone know that? I see a few nodding heads, so some of you are aware of that. Very handy to know if you don't have a, a rubber eraser with you and you might perhaps have a piece of bread. I don't know why you would, but perhaps. In medieval times, bread was used as an absorbent plate. It was called a trencher. And after the meal, the trencher could then be eaten or given to the poor or fed to the dogs. There is a theory that says that this is where pizza comes from, the idea of a trencher, a bread base with toppings on top of it. Now, a baker's dozen, if you didn't know this, is a phrase that means 13 items. Now, the practice comes from medieval times when bread was sold in smaller loaves, um, most often in standard dozens of 12 pieces. Now, some loaves were lighter than others because bakers tried to rob the people on the weight um, and because of the different weight of ingredients, not all dozens were equal. So strict law at that time, in medieval times, made it a requirement that bread be sold by weight. And by adding an additional loaf to the dozen, customers were getting the required weight by law. And that's why it's called a baker's dozen. Um, a combine needs nine minutes to harvest enough wheat to make about 70 loaves of bread. That's a lot of bread. The longest loaf of bread ever baked was, can anybody guess how long? Sorry? Seven? Ten. Meters. No, a bit more than that. Somebody said a mile. I heard somebody say a mile. Almost close enough. 1.2 kilometers. I don't know where you find an oven big enough to bake that type of bread. But the longest loaf of bread ever baked was 1.2 kilometers. Now, I don't know how much that is in miles. I know 1.6 kilometers make a mile. So that means it's close enough to a mile long. The Great Fire of London started at the bakery. Did you know that? Okay. Um, bread became a staple food during the Neolithic era, era, era around 10,000 years ago. So we've been eating bread for, as a staple food for nearly 10,000 years. The sandwich. Can anybody tell me? where the term sandwich comes from for two pieces of bread containing something. An earl, yes. Oh, you, you know, I'm very surprised at the amount of knowledge in church this morning. The sandwich is named after John Montague, the fourth earl of sandwich, who started a fashion of eating beef between two pieces of bread. Every year in the UK, around 12 billion sandwiches are eaten. That means 380 sandwiches every second in the UK. Let that sink in for a moment. <laughs> um, each American consumes on average 53 pounds of bread per year. Um, bread symbolizes peace in most cultures of the world. Uh, Germany has the longest consumption of bread per capita worldwide, the largest consumption of bread per capita worldwide, followed by Chile. Um, an average slice of packaged bread contains one gram of fat and 75 to 80 calories. Now, you might be asking yourself, why is this minister rambling on useless facts of bread this early on a Sunday morning? And the theme for today, you will notice as we go through our readings, you will learn that the theme for today is going to be bread. 
and how bread feeds us as humans. Bread has become a staple food for many, many years, and we find it in the Bible. Even Jesus uses the, the image of bread to refer to himself. Now, there's one last fact that I want to underline our conversation about bread this morning, and that is that the word companion comes from the Latin com, meaning with, and panis, meaning bread. So from Latin, if you go into the etymology of it, the word companion means the person you share your bread with. And that is something I thought was really, really interesting. And I want that to underline a part of our conversation this morning when we talk about bread. Let's pray. Loving God, we gather in worship today because you sought us and found us. We come as we are, knowing a place is prepared for us. We bring what we have to receive what you give to us. Bread of life for the world, grow your kingdom within us. Holy God, as we lean in and try it, step forward and grab it, Open our arms and embrace it, and clench our fists to touch it. As we sit back and enjoy it, breathe deep and inhale it. Slow down to allow it. We lend an ear so to hear it. Lift our eyes so to see it. Widen our mouths to receive it. Taste it and see it, bread broken and gifted life for the world and kingdom to come. Lord, this living word, might it perplex and rebuke us, challenge and unnerve us, surprise and delight us, nourish and fulfill us. Bread come from heaven, yet risen within us, gift to the world, yet here right beside us. Let us taste and see. Hear us as we offer our prayers in the words of Jesus, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hymn 606, Lord, you sometimes speak in wonders.
Our first reading this morning is from 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 4 to 8. It's a a short piece of scripture, and uh, preceding this part of the story, Elijah had a very uh, meaningful triumph over the Baal prophets on Mount Carmel. But soon after this, he is pursued by Bathsheba, who wants to kill him. And he flees to the desert where he ends up asking the Lord to take his life rather than let him suffer this humiliation. And this is where our story continues with Brenda reading for us this morning. Thank you. Elijah walked a whole day into the wilderness. He stopped and sat down in the shade of a tree and wished he would die. It's too much, Lord, he pleaded. Take away my life. Might as well be dead. He lay down under the tree and fell asleep. Suddenly, an angel touched him and said, Wake up and eat. He looked around and saw a loaf of bread and a jar of water near his head. He ate and drank and lay down again. The Lord's angel returned and woke him a second time, saying, Get up and eat, or the journey will be too much for you. Elijah got up ate and drank, and the food gave him enough strength to walk forty days to Sinai, the holy mountain. Here in 555, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. <laughs> Jesus at this stage because they saw what he did with the loaves and fishes 
and um, they are pursuing him, wanting him to do more miracles so they can see it. But Jesus has news for them and tells them that he is in fact the bread of heaven. This we will listen to again now in verse 35 and then from verse 41 to 51 he tells them what this means. I am the bread of life, Jesus told them. Those who come to me will never be hungry. Those who believe in me will never be thirsty. The people started grumbling about him because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. So they said, This man is Jesus, son of Joseph, isn't he? We know his father and mother. How then does he now say he comes down from heaven? Jesus answered, Stop grumbling among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me, and I will raise him to life on the last day. The prophet wrote, Everyone will be taught by God. Anyone who hears the Father and learns from him comes to me. This does not mean that anyone who has seen the Father, he who is from God, is the only one who has seen the Father. I am telling you the truth. He who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the desert, but they died. But the bread that comes down from heaven is of such a kind that whoever eats it will not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give them is my flesh, which I give so that he, the world may die. Oh, sorry which I guess so that one of them will be alive. Thanks be to God for the readings of this holy word. Each time I read Elijah's story, especially when he flees into the desert, I can almost see Elijah as the poster child for depression. He just had a massive victory for God on Mount Carmel where his God triumphed over the, over the Baal prophets. But threats from Bathsheba sends him into a downward spiral of depression, causing him to flee into the desert, where he repeatedly asked God to end his life. Our first reading this morning was one of several occasions in this part of Scripture where Elijah asked God to end his life. He is not okay, and his fear and sadness seem almost illogical given what he had witnessed from God on Mount Carmel just a wee while before. But still, this is where he finds himself, doubting God's protection and goodwill towards him. It takes an angel to come to him with bread to give him the sustenance he needs to keep going. Interestingly, this does not end Elijah's doubting, but gives him what he needs to keep living in that moment. He would again later ask for his life to be ended. But it is worth noting that through the angelic bread, God gives him enough to keep him going for the next phase of his journey. The Gospel reading from John is very closely linked with last week's reading where Jesus tells the crowds that he is the bread of life. This is the first of seven I am declarations by Jesus in John's Gospel. Jesus expands on this idea in our reading. His declaration is met with resistance from the crowd. Up until now, they had on, all they had on their minds were the physical wonders and the physical bread brought forth by it. As they are beginning to get to grips with what Jesus was actually saying, they feel uncomfortable with what seemed to them to be Jesus' overinflated sense of self. In fact, they try to proverbially cut him back down to size by referring to his humble origin this man is the son of Joseph, isn't he? How can this man, wondrous as he may be, declare himself to be bread from heaven? 
If we were to read on, we would see how when Jesus expands on this idea of the bread, he declares that his flesh is to be eaten, eaten, referring, of course, to the Lord's Supper. The crowd is completely disgusted and soon disperses. They give up on Jesus, believing him to be another lunatic and considering themselves fooled by his tricks. People seeking hope in a world of suffering and oppression often give up on the source of all hope like these people did in our gospel reading. They were living in a world of suffering and oppression. Jesus comes and declares himself to be the source of all hope for them, but they give up on him. Despite what he said, and despite the wonders he did, they give up and go home hopeless and feeling cheated. Much like Elijah gave up on God, even after witnessing the miracle of the defeat of the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel. We as humans are often disillusioned when faced with hardship and oppression. Even the slightest resistance to all our wonderful plans can send us in a downward spiral of depression and doubt. It seems it's part of human nature to retreat into desolation, hopelessness and doubt when met with resistance. But it is in the depth of this desolation and in the depth of this hopelessness that the bread from the angel gives hope and courage just enough to keep Elijah going. I like to think that many of these people who rejected Jesus when he professed himself to be the bread of life would many years later, when they celebrated the Lord's Supper in each other's homes, as we read in Acts, that they would think back to this very day when Jesus told them who he was, And that in that moment, the bread on their table would be more than mere bread. But that it would give them strength and courage to keep going and give life another chance. I like to think that although they did not realize the significance of Jesus' words and did not recognize him as the source of life, later on, every meal would become a reminder of Jesus' love, compassion, and care. It would become more than a physical meal. It would provide spiritual strength in the face of persecution and trouble. Sometimes, bread is more than mere bread. Sometimes, a meal is more than a mere meal. I'm reminded of a film based on the book The Help. Has anybody seen that film before? Do yourself a favor and find it. This film based on the book The Help written by Catherine Stockett. It tells the story of a group of colored women living in the southern part of the USA in the 1950s where they are very much oppressed and segregation is very much a part of everyday life for them. The story centers around a group of black women who work for white women while battling the oppression they experience every day. Not only at the hands of their white masters, but at home also. One of the characters, Minnie, is a comical, outspoken and sometimes outrageous figure On top of all the abuse she suffers at work, she is also abused by her husband at home. After refusing to use the outside toilet reserved for the use for the use of the help, she is fired and starts working with another family. The lady of the house where she now finds herself working is also rejected by the community because of some of her life choices. But like many, 
she also hides a terrible past fraught with trauma. Together they form a unit of two women of different races caring for each other and helping each other find hope in a hopeless world. But what really brings the story together for me is when Minnie comes to work one day to find that her mistress had prepared a whole meal just for her. In the film, the narrator announces that this meal wasn't just a meal. It was the meal that gave Minnie the strength to take her children and leave her abusive marriage. It gave her the strength to announce that she would be standing up for herself, that she was a person who mattered. This meal was more than a meal. The love and compassion that was baked into it made it a source of strength and power. For us who have not been able to see our loved ones for months on end, because of the pandemic, all of us can attest to the importance and our longing to share a meal with our loved ones. For many, the respite and restrictions allowing families to enjoy a Christmas meal gave them what they needed to keep going. For us as Christians, we believe, we have come to believe strongly that sometimes bread is not just bread and wine is not just wine. That in Jesus and through the physical act of sharing a special meal, we too can be nourished in more than one sense. We too can receive the strength needed to face a hostile world and find in it hope, love and compassion. As we head home today, undoubtedly many of us to share in a meal with ourselves or our families, might we be reminded that a meal can be more than a meal, that bread can be more than bread. Might we be reminded that in Jesus bread and wine became a source of strength and hope, like the angel feeding Elijah. May our meals give us more than physical sustenance. Because Jesus gave himself as the ultimate offering. Amen. Let us now listen to the organ voluntary as we reflect on our readings and the sermon.
Let us pray. Bread of life given for the world this day, Lord, hear our prayer. For the nations in turmoil, all the places torn by war, famine and dictatorship, places where safety, life and sustenance is not guaranteed, O Lord, hear our prayer. For our warming planet, especially in the light of all the natural disasters we have come to accept as part of our reality, for people displaced by flooding and wildfires, for nature groaning under the ever-increasing demands for more resources to feed humanity's unquenchable thirst for wealth. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For our cities and neighborhoods, further afield, but also here in our own community, for those suffering from abuse, addiction, and social exclusion, for parents worried about their children and children longing for love and attention, O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For our neighbors in sorrow, all who are grieving for family and loved ones whose voices have fallen silent or unrecognizable due to death, injury, mental illness, or dementia, for those battling silent battles they cannot share, O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For our suffering sisters and brothers in places where your message of grace, love, and acceptance is not accepted, and often met with violence and persecution. O oh Lord, hear our prayer. For all the households represented here today, O oh Lord, hear our prayer. Amen. Our last hymn is hymn 167, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah. And you will see on the first verse, the second last line, Bread of heaven, Bread of heaven, feed me till my want is over. Go now in peace and receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. 
the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace.